So Richard, Scotland 1974, why did you decide to write uh, what is a wonderful book about Scotland 1974 as opposed to, for example, Scotland 1978, the Ali Macleod debacle, which you mentioned Ali Macleod in the previous discussion, why did you go for that? Uh, simply because uh, I think 78 has been done to death, I mean it's been well and truly covered and it was never going to be a particularly uplifting tale to try to tell. 74 we looked at, I spoke to my agent, um, Kevin, and um, we were looking for something to follow up Glory in Gothenburg, which had done in the Aberdeen winning the Cupners Cup. That was 30 years on. Um, and I enjoyed that format of, of tracking down the old players, setting up the interviews, doing a lot of research, live race only. So I was looking to do something similar. Um, we looked at anniversaries, essentially. Mm -hmm. Coming so was it your idea? Well, Kevin and I spoke about it, yeah, in, this, in the midst of the conversation, this was, this was what came up. Um, I think he probably pitched it initially, um, and as soon as he did, I kind of got that feeling, yeah, because I remember, it was, essentially it was my first World Cup, or certainly the first I, I watched at Scotland Morant. I remembered it. Um, I remembered the players. And I just thought, well, you look at that squad, it's very, very good players in that squad, and really big characters as well. I thought, it's got to be. There's got to be stories to tell there. So I started to research um, and pretty quickly came to the conclusion that um, there was a story to be told. And actually, in, in many respects, I kind of felt it was, it was almost like Scotland's forgotten World Cup um, because 70, as I say, had been covered lots. The more recent ones, I say all things are relative, but you, you can imagine they're a bit more fresh in the mind. And it was 74 that kicked it all off, you know, our, our great run of qualifying for the final. So all put all those things together, we went to the publishers, they were happy to go with it, and um, that's how it came about. So you wrote it basically in a chronological series of events going back to the 50s and really taking it forwards briefly from there into the, the, the 70s? Yeah, I mean I just thought it was worth placing it in context. Um, I mean I guess all Scottish football fans probably know the history, but it's it just in terms of, of placing where, why 74 um, offered the excitement and, and the hype I suppose. Um, that it did and why there was there was just this this great enthusiasm for that because we hadn't been at a finals for such a long time. Um, so I just yeah, place it in contact, really pick up from the failure to qualify um, from nineteen seventy World Cup finals, the departure of Bobby Brown, Tommy Doherty coming in on a, a temporary basis and then like a just a whirlwind um, and then um, getting the job full time because he moved on as the campaign kicked off and then Willie Ormond took over, a very different character um, and then it really just picks up through the qualifying campaign and the bulk of it is the finals itself. Tommy Doherty seemed to be perhaps the catalyst in terms of the, the success because the results prior to that and even Ormond's results before the, the actual finals themselves, the results were fairly varied. I mean I don't think anyone will forget Ormond's first the debut game against England, which was a five nothing thrashing at Hamden. Yeah, his um, his results actually. There was a period leading up to the finals where I think he'd won two games out of eleven, which was the same as Bobby Brown had had prior to him being uh, relieved of his duties. Um, what the players said was that that Doherty was much better placed just to handle those big characters. We don't. Although, I mean, clearly things unfolded and, and events did um, occur that made the headlines. But, you know, guys like Billy Brown and like Jimmy Johnson, um, some, some of the players were younger, they were coming in and they came in through that period, you know, Kenny Douglas and, and Danny McGrain, um, Joe Jordan came into Dennis Law, of course, just, mm. just kind of like a, a giant, a stride the, the rest of the game. I mean, so big names, big players, um, and Doherty could handle them. Uh, and they all said this, they said they needed someone just to instill a little bit of discipline. And um, he did, he did. Uh, Willie Orman maybe less so once he took over. You've actually stolen some of my questions that I was going to ask you about. I was going to ask you about the, the, the characters in it, because I was assuming you're drinking tea if you come from Aberdeen and you admire Dennis Law, because yeah. that certainly comes yeah. through. Uh, the, the characters that jump out of the book are, are Bremner and Johnston, uh, and to a lesser degree Law. Uh, Johnston, if I can ask you specifically yeah. about Johnston, Johnson, in the eyes of, of some of the people that you quote, and you know, even some of his fellow players, they reckon he was the greatest player of that era. But what do you really think happened with Johnson following upon the Largs fiasco? And the fact that he was picked to play against yeah. England, was man of the match, even after the Largs rainbow incident, and then never even featured as a substitute in the World Cup games. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think actually Ormond was very strong in 
selecting him after that whole rowing boat fiasco. Um, and he was repaid by the player. The player went down and put in a man of the match performance against England. They then um, went to Belgium and then Norway for the last two warm up matches and um, sadly got involved in another incident in Norway, Johnson and Bremner. And although it wasn't, um, it wasn't anything major, a few drinks were taken and a few voices were raised, but there was no scuffle, no fighting or anything like this. It was, excuse me, it was one step too far, I think, for Willie Ormond and the SFA. And I mean, th there was a danger that um, both players, Brendan and Johnson, were going to be sent home before the World Cup even started. Yeah, you, you come across as if they, they would have left. Right. I, I, well, well, they were they were on the verge of it, but the SFA also, um, the SFA had a meeting lasted a couple of hours, and then they decided to severely reprimand the players rather than send them home. Um, but there certainly is. Um, I mean, I wasn't able to, to verify it, but there's a, a clear feeling, I think, from a number of the players that there was a, an edict from up above, basically, from the SFA to Willie Orman, so he does not play mm -hmm. at the World Cup Finals. You know, yeah. We don't have the shame of him being sent home, but he doesn't play. And it's, I mean, it's tragic because um, you think, he, he was really slightly before my time, um, at, at his absolute best, but I think we've all seen the video footage, and he was just the most incredible player. So skillful, but so strong. You know, he super shoots and being fouled, bouncing back mm -hmm. up again, still ball at his feet. And um, the feeling was, you know, put him on last, even if he didn't start last 20 minutes against Zaire, with your 2 0 up, and he could have run ring. Brazil, we played so well against Brazil, nil nil draw, should have beaten him again, you know, as they were tiring. Get him on, get him attacking the full backs. It might have made the difference. And it's a crying shame. I mean, it is a crying shame that he didn't play in a World Cup final. when you think of everything else he did in his career. Yeah, Law obviously feels that yeah. the tact that you've just spoken about, he's yeah. certainly you're quoting him that he would have thought he should have been brought on, as, at mm. least as a substitute in some of the games. Yeah. Bremner as well comes across as a really strong character, but one of the stories that as a football fan I hadn't heard was the Bremner Lorimer car story. You're already laughing yourself. I mean, without giving too much away, and I would encourage people to buy the book yeah. to read the story, I actually wonder how you found that out because you could not make that story up. Uh, Peter Lorimer was great actually. Um, I'd never met Peter before and he couldn't have been more helpful. Went down to Leeds, um, sat with him for a couple of hours I guess and just chatted and he was very, very open um, about everything. But but was particularly fascinating about Bremner because obviously he played with him at Leeds United, he worked with him on a day-to-day -day basis. He knew how much trouble Billy could be off the park but he also knew what a fierce competitor he was on the park, and he liked his beer, and he liked his facts, but it never got in the way. You know, he was still the fittest man out in the park. I mean, he must have been the most incredible specimen to do what he did. But the particular story, um, it had been a Scotland game, and Peter said he always had to drive him up because Billy, as soon as he, basically, as soon as they turned out of the street of Leeds, Billy was having a beer in the car. <laughs> um, but then after the game. Uh, Billy was, he was arranging his testimonial match and he would go up to Stirling to meet Alex Smith and, and David Katanak who were two of his great pals and he said to Peter, look I'll take the car and I'll bring it back, I'll come and pick you up the next morning and Peter rather foolishly had agreed to this scenario. So the next morning he's um, sitting in the um, hotel waiting and waiting and waiting, no sign of Bremner. This is way before this mobile is, phone. Yeah, oh yeah of course and, and this is the hotel in Glasgow and of course he's due training in Leeds so he phoned Don Revy and said look boss, I don't know where Billy is, he hasn't picked me up, this is what was supposed to happen. And he said, um, Bremner was such a favourite of Revy, he said, Revy immediately started blaming Peter <laughs> for what was going on. Anyway, he'd gone back, and it was back in the day, as you see, no mobile phones, so you've got the guy in the hotel wandering around with a big placard with call from Mr Borrower on it, so Peter's gone. And it is Billy, who's on the other end of the line. And he said, Billy, where are you? <laughs> I'm at Scotch Corner. I've only just sobered up and remember it's your car I'm driving. <laughs> you just could not make that up. That, that's bound to be an absolute genuine story. So, yeah. um, he just carried on back down the road and um, Peter had to go and get a uh, train and head back down. The road. It was just so terrible. did you enjoy doing the book? Because yeah. it comes across that your research must have been amazing because yeah. to actually find out as much as you did. It was great fun. I mean, it really was. There was an awful lot that um, I wasn't aware of. You know, I knew the story of the finals. I knew the, the players. Um, and I knew how good that team was. But I didn't know um, the background. There was a guy called Bob Bain. You know, the, the players appointed as a commercial manager who promised them the earth and delivered the single Easy Easy in the, the album 
Scotland, Scotland, and Air. That's it. Uh, oh, sorry, Vauxhall VX490. They, yeah. Each player got a car. But they thought they were going to get the car, exactly. but it wasn't given the cars, it was just the use of a car. They got a car for a year, after which point they could either um, hand it back or buy it at a discounted price. Um, it, he'd come in with tales of, of making the millions and, um, and and it really didn't pan out. I mean, incredible to think, before the World Cup Finals, they, there was a deal, or they thought it was a boot deal. And I think the players actually, by this point, had almost taken over themselves. Um, but they couldn't get an agreement. And it was Adidas, they had the boots wrong. So the players actually, before the World Cup kicked off, were all sitting, picking the little stripes, the three stripes off the side of their boots because they didn't want to be seen to be wearing Adidas boots because no deal had been reached. I mean, just incredible to think the guys playing at the World Cup finals for Scotland were sitting doing that before the match. And I, I mean, there were loads of little stories like that that just kept coming through uh, in the coverage and that's, that's, that helped to make it so much fun. Have you been pleased the way the book has been received by fellow pundits and the football fraternity? Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of good feedback. Um, I think a lot of people, certainly um, of my era, have a similar warmth and affection for that team and that World Cup. So, um, yeah, got a good response from them. And um, none of the players have complained, the ones that um, I wrote about, and that's always a plus. So that's <laughs> a positive sign and nobody uh, complains about yeah. it. Right, thanks Richard. We'll now find out in the next section what you think of up-to-date Scotland. Thank you.